Exodus chapter 3. I want to read two, three verses. Thank you. Chapter 3, verse 18. Verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that thy, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now look at the last phrase. Anoint thine eyes, that thou mayest see. Somebody say, that thou mayest see. Say it again. Once more. Father, we ask that you anoint our eyes. Every man, every woman, under the sound of my voice, I pray, Holy Ghost, in from my heart, that you will anoint our eyes in the name of Jesus. Lord, anoint our eyes that we may see. That we may see. That we may see. We may see potentials. We may see possibilities. We may see victories. We may see the trophy in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Anoint your eyes that you may see. That means there are people that are not seeing. But what they see, they're not seeing right. What you see molds your mind. Molds your thoughts and opinions. They tell us that what we see influences us seven times more than what we hear. That's what they have proven. That what you see or drama influences the mind more than audio seven times seven times they say that what you see gets stuck in your memory unlike what you hear you have to hear it seven times for you to remember it but once you see it once is there that's what i'm saying what you see and what you hear and the problem with church and with me as a pastor that's why is that as a preacher i have to preach a message seven times for you to see it once that's what it means I have to preach a message seven times for you to see it once. Because if it's just, if you're going to transmit vision or passion or a cause through audio, then you have to do it seven more times. That's why people don't know why I deploy drama a lot. I tell a drama group, come on, add drama. Drama, why? Because people catch it faster. Remember it easier when they see it than when they just hear it. Visuals. Anoint your eyes and that you may see. You're not seeing right. You cannot be a champion without vision. You cannot win in life in, on, in any area without vision. I've preached it here several times. What drives champions in life is vision. Vision. Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Vision. God had to show Paul. After Paul got saved, the first thing God did was to take his sight for three days. God knew for me to arrest this guy, I have to take his physical vision. Because if he was still seeing, he would be restless. So because he took his sight, he couldn't see anything anymore. So he became calm. He sat there. He couldn't move. He couldn't do anything. Vision. Vision. There are churches that are driven by vision. There are Christians who drive their lives by vision. And there are those that don't have any vision. I'm telling you. Whenever I conduct interviews, when I ask others that come office, I ask them about the four areas I look at when I conduct interviews. One, your morals. I don't know. I, I, I just tell me about yourself. I don't look at CVs. I don't look at CVs. I read the CVs and say 15 degrees. Tell me about yourself. I want to know the person that owns these, these degrees. So when I get to know your morals, the second second I ask you, five years from now, ten years, what's your vision? Where would you like to be? So many people feel it. Eh, well, I don't know where I will be. Ah, uh, they can't work with me. Because somebody will say, I want to be this. I'm ambitious. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious. Jesus said, Look, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You shall be witness unto me where? In Jerusalem, in Judea. That's ambition. In Samaria, that's ambition. And uttermost parts. He was this guy that had no church. He had no church, and he said, Uttermost part of the world. That's ambition. So I don't know how Christ will say, Everywhere. Everywhere. That's ambition. Jesus himself said that. He said, don't stop here. Take the next territory. Move to the next after one. Take everywhere. 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 You can't win without vision. You can't. Many people out there believe that talent is all that matters. That's not true. Some believe skills is what you need. That's not totally true. Your skills are useless. Your talents are useless without vision. God told Samson that. Now I'm going to tell you the story of two, three champions in life. Samson was a champion. He lost his mojo when he lost his sight. 
He was a champion. We use the word anointing to talk about his strength and his skills. You can be anointed, but without a vision, you're dead. He was a champion. David, David went to the battlefield to dethrone or depose the reigning champion. His name was Goliath. There's a new kid on the block. I want to win in this territory. I know you're thinking Bill Gates is the biggest thing that ever happened to the world. No, somebody else is going to dethrone him. The person is just David. He's waiting. You don't know who the person is coming from. Maybe Asia, maybe China, somewhere out there. You will see somebody else is planning to dethrone Mark Zuckerberg. People are planning to dethrone the next person. Who knew 40 years ago that Mark was existing? Nobody knew. Business just showed up from somewhere. Those guys just keep showing up. They keep, I mean, I was saying in the story, one of the guys that impresses me and excites me the most in the marketplace is that guy called that Alibaba guy. That guy said I was a failure. I had attended many interviews. I failed everywhere. But I knew there was something in me that can make me win. I'm a champion. I'm a winner. I just don't know where and how. I know there's so much. I'm full of potentials. Yet, to reveal them. Yet, to express them. But I'll keep digging. I'll keep trying until I can express who I am. There's somebody here yet to be known or revealed. Vision. You cannot win without vision. You have to see it for you to get it. Look at yourself five years from now, who do you see? Ten years from now, who do you see? You have to see yourself holding the trophy. You have to see yourself saying, I want to play in the league of champions, league of winners. I, and there's nothing, you see, what the church has done very well, look at me, look at me. What the church has done what, very well is that there are different kind of churches. Hmm? All different kind of pastors or leaders. Hmm? Watch me, everybody. Pastor Trial, we, over the last few years, and where I grew up from, we build morals, which is the strength of every character. We build morals in people. We tell them to come to church to make them good people, but not great people. We build you to be morally strong, how to fight off, how to fend off bribery, how not to be corrupt, how to do good, how not to have a girlfriend in your office, how to make sure you're a righteous person. We teach you morals because we believe character is bigger than charisma and that's true. Because if you win and you don't have morals or character, when, when tough times come, you break. When tough times come, when things come to test your character, your strength, you break. So we tell you, hey, let's prepare you. Let's equip you. Let's mold you. So you'll be strong morally, strong character-wise, because you're going somewhere. But we forget to tell them where to go to. So we only teach them to be morally strong, going nowhere. So we say, sir, I'm ready. For what? I don't know. Just be morally strong. For what, sir? Why should I be morally strong? Just be morally strong. Why? Just be strong morally. Why? Just be strong. Why? I'm supposed to go out there and conquer the world, be a winner, bring men to Christ. But the problem is that we want to make sure that the person going out there to win is a strong person morally, strong on the inner man. So we try to teach you morals here. But at the same time, there's another group of pastors, another category of churches who are saying, you know what, we've built so many moral creatures that are losing in life. So many good people that are losing out there in the world. They're losing the marketplace. They're not winners. They are being subjugated. They are being conquered. They are being, you know, dominion is not being expressed. Other people that are not Christians are the ones leading and ruling because they have something else these guys don't have. These guys lack passion. They lack energy. They lack ambition. They lack vision. They lack everything. They only go to church with their heads bowed, like my son would say. They go to work every Monday to Friday, just trying to tick the box, and then come back to church on Sunday and say, I, I made it this week. I didn't collect bribe this week. I didn't do anything this week. But guess what? You didn't do anything this week. Following week, following year, 10 years after, 30 years after, and five years after, 35 years, retirement. Ah, oh, praise God. I made it on scathed. No scandal. No. You get It's here. Somewhere out here. So we don't win. David went to the battle and said, I want to win here. And David won there. We have different fields that we all play in life. Do you want to win in yours? You have to first define your field. A young lady came to meet me recently and said, I have a passion for ministry. I have strong passion for ministry. I said, you've got to make sure you're double sure. Because if you're going to come to ministry on full time, and she's going to come with me on full time very soon with us. I said, I'm going to throw my way behind you. I'm going to give you a platform to express your giftings and talents. And you're going to say to yourself, it's not money. Because we all have different drives. 
the reward and the reproach are two different things. Different things drive different fighters in life. It can't be money driving someone in ministry. It must be lives changing. Mahatma Gandhi never had money as his major focus. Most of us here have passion for money-related enterprises. That's the challenge. That's the problem. That's why we don't win. Because we don't know our fields. We don't know where to fight or where our strength lies. We don't know it. We lose out because what is driving us is money. Those people are driven by their passion. This young lady discovered early in life and said to me, this is what I want to do. This is who I am. This is where I want to be. I'm somewhere else making money right now, but I'm unhappy. I'm there unhappy, making money, but I think I'll be up here. Here. Now, by the way, she said, everybody I've spoken to say you are stupid. You have a bright and brilliant chance in marketplace. Why go there? Why go to ministry when you are? Why not? Why? Leave that place. It's money. She said, but no, I'm there, but there's something in me just saying this is not where I belong. My skills and giftings are meant for this place, not that place. I'm uncomfortable. I'm not fulfilled there. I am rewarded. I have money, but unfulfilled. And that's why we're all afraid of stepping out of shadows and staying where we feel we belong to. Stay there and enjoy doing what you're doing, changing lives. And be fulfilled. Go, to, go home at night, sleep, and be fulfilled. That's where you can win. Find out where your anointing lies. Find out where your gifts and talents are. Stay there. Fight there. Conquer there. Don't follow the rat race. You see, the problem with the rat race and the Christian race is that both are different kinds of races. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Christians say, I don't understand it. All of you don't understand it. You don't know that there's a Christian race and there's a rat race. There's a Christian race, there's a rat race. I'm going to tell you the difference now. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, 2, 3, it says, we should run the race. Yes or no? Run the race with patience. Even though I'm still trying to understand how you can run with patience. Let us run with patience. Oh God, I wish I could preach now. Because running and patience are not together. Because that means you don't understand what patience. You think patience means slow. You can be fast and be patient. And you don't understand what. See, patience is a virtue. It has nothing to do with pace. My dear, I know where I'm going to in life. I'm patient, but I'm fast. I'm, and, and because how can you run with patience? Run. Patience. Run. Patience. Run. Patience. Because we think, because we don't understand what patience. They say run the race slowly. It didn't say run the race slowly. Patience is a virtue. Virtue. We need to understand what the Greek word patience means. It's a virtue. It's like an oxymoron. How can I be running and be patient? Run! I told somebody in my office, I said there are four scenarios in life about most churches. Number one, watch me, everybody. The church going to the right place, but with the wrong pace. Watch me. The right place is eternity. I'm taking all these people to heaven, Lord. The journey, the destination are two different things. I know where we are going, Jennifer. I will keep my church on the right place. Heaven is the ultimate place. Don't lose sight of a place. Christ said, believe in me. Believe in the Lord. I'm going to a place. I'm going to prepare a place, a place for you. A place. So we should not lose sight of where? Somebody shout, the place. Shout, the place. Now, however, while going to the place, at which pace? Some are slow and some are zealous or fast. Some churches are running, they're zealous, they want to get there like before others, as it were. John outran Peter, go to the tomb. John 19. When he heard Christ what had risen, he outran Peter. He ran faster. They were going to the same place, but one had more pace. Are you with me now, church? Watch me. Are you with me? Now, we, 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 our church, my opinion, our church trial belongs to the second group. Go into the place, but slow. We're not zealous. We're not hungry. We're not aggressive. We're not passionate. We're not, you know, we just lack energy. We lack energy. We just want to take it easy. Uh, Monday. No, our neighbors, watch me. The third scenario, scenario one, going to the right place with a fast pace. 
scenario two, right place with a slow pace. Some say the right pace is better than the slow or fast pace. I choose to say the right pace is a fast pace. For the king's business requires haste. I believe so. You can't carry out the king's business in a slow pace. You must, your zeal shows your belief that that thing is from God. Now watch me, scenario three. Wrong place. Fast pace. Taking men to hell in a hurry. <laughs> Taking men to hell in a hurry. Let's go, let's go. Fast pace, wrong place. Scenario four is wrong place, slow pace. Do you get the four scenarios? Because I'm trying to ask God, where, where, where is Fota? I know where we are, and I'm trying to get us to the right pace. I'm saying, Lord, let's do this thing with the right pace. Let's put some urgency into our kingdom matter. Because you think you have time. You don't. I was born yesterday, but today I know my age. I'm like, ah, be a no she me. How many more years do I have to live? You think you are still young? And now five years added to your age, you find you are getting older. You don't have time. You don't have time. You don't have time. Don't think I see a time. You don't have time. They came to Jesus. Tell us when will the kingdom be restored? Say, what's your business with being restored? Go and preach. The power will come upon you. Go and do stuff for me. Win your world. He was concerned with doing the work. Now, all this restoration, uh, that's the reward. Do the work. Last night, I was telling Mr. Wally Jenkins, I don't 10 o'clock, I was restless in my room. I was growing my spirit. Restless. I got to my car. I drove around slowly, praying in tongues. And I was in traffic at 10 p.m. In traffic. And I'm like, ah, this has, I see people. You, I see souls, you see people. When you look at that traffic, I saw souls. I said, look at soul lady. These people are living here. I see souls. You see traffic. I see souls. You, you see people. I see converts. Potential converts. 10 p.m. in traffic. People are going. And I said, God, open. Anoint my eyes. I must seem right. Anoint my eyes that I may see what you see. You cannot win without a vision. You cannot be a champion without a vision. You must live for something or else you die for nothing. You must live for something or else you will die for nothing. I don't want to die for nothing and we will die. But when you go, what would they say about you? What would they say about you? Nobody's too young to die. Nobody's too young to die. If you want to be a winner and a champion, you must change. You see, there are three kinds of visions. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. Give me. Because I want you to see the three kinds of eyes that we have. So I can ask you, where do you live? Before the things, there was, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the eyes were four beasts. Full of highs. Where? Before means future. Behind means past. Read verse 8. Don't forget, highs. The beast in the presence of God have highs before, highs behind. Then also add eyes full of eyes when? Within. So three kinds of highs or three kinds of vision. Everybody here belongs to one of the three. One, there are three kinds of people. One, there are people that live in the past. Many of them live in the past. Two, there are people that live in the present alone. And three, there are people that live in the future. You can't be a winner or a champion if you live in the past. See tomorrow. See tomorrow. See tomorrow. Start seeing what others are not seeing. Task yourself to see tomorrow. See tomorrow. Be driven by the future, not the past. Three kinds of people. Those that live in the past. Christ lives in the three realms. Because we said Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and or the future. The word forever means the future. So Christ lived in the three realms. 
Hebrews 13 verse 8, lived in the past, lived in today, and you find him in the future. I'd rather choose the Christ of the future than the Christ of the past. I choose to live in the future. I choose to see a new solution. I may not see it in my lifetime, but I will keep dreaming it. I'll keep envisioning it. I'll keep envisioning it. Envisioning a photo full of young people, 65% or 75% of young people of the population are young, full of young people that are bubbling, that are Christians, that are changing their world. Turn it upside down. Passionate. Passionate. Driven. I choose to see tomorrow. I choose to live in the future. I want to live not in the past, but in the future. Tell me about the future. I want to have multiple dreams on my table so I can be chasing them. We have to deliberately change the way things are done. It won't be accidental. It has to be deliberate. I want to live ahead of my time. I want to live in the future. I'm tired of living in the present. I want to see 20 years from now and say, Lord, how do I want to live? See the future. People just live in the present. They have only eyes within, not eyes before. Not, they leave eyes behind. You cannot win without vision. You need to challenge yourself and go and sit down somewhere and begin to write your own vision down. The vision of the kind of life you want to live. Church is not an escapist idea. Uh, come from that place, come and sit here. Uh, please, so they're against us. Church is meant to go out there. This is an equipment house. I equip you, I retool you, you go out and you conquer. You come back and say, I need fuel. I refuel you. Church is like a gas station. Buy some gas here, go out and change the place. Go and conquer. There are many areas where you can conquer. Many areas you cannot be a champion if you cannot dream of one, of being one. You, cannot, you, can, you have to play in the league of champions. It has to be you saying, I want to play in that league. They don't have two heads. You have age on your, on your side. You have time. You have to be a winner. You have to rise up today and say, let me start thinking like a champion. I want to live like a champion. I want to be a winner. I hate losing. Losing and failing are two different things. I'm not a failure. I'm not a loser. I failed a couple of times. But I'm not a loser. I'll keep trying because I will win. I'll keep trying. I'm not going to give up. I'll keep fighting. You know what Paul said? Paul used two phrases in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26. And this is very important for you to run the race. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight, not as one that beats the hair. The only picture I see when I see one that beats the air is one. Lack of, that's all. That's not, you, you, can't, you can't have vision and you're beating the air. You can see, you follow your opponent. You know, as a boxer, but your opponent is going this way, you're following him. Going that way, you're following him. Following this way, you're following him. As a boxer, as a puncher. But it's only when you are blindfolded you are punching the air. What will make a man beat the air or punch the air? Because many of us are throwing punches at the air. It's vision. Paul said, I cannot fight without vision. I cannot win. You can't be a winner if you have no vision. I therefore so fight. Not as one that beats the air. In other words, not without a vision. I must know who to throw my punches at. And God has told us where to do it as a church. Rise to your feet. Put your hands together for Jesus. Morning. So you've been blessed by that message. However, I would like to get something from you. I love feedbacks a lot. Communication is not just telling something, also about receiving the feedback. I would like to hear from you, read from you, perhaps even call me. There are numbers on the screen right now, and my email address is right now on the screen. Guess what? That email address gets directly to my box. We have a link to me. I promise you, I will reply you. Should you have questions about the message, issues you want me to probably consider, maybe topics you want me to preach about, or perhaps also to address during one of my sermons, kindly send me a mail now. I love feedbacks. I would love to hear from you. And hey, if you're out there, you're not born again. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You have to do it. You don't have to just turn off this dial without giving your life to Christ. That's all. That's why we're here, to lead men to Christ. 
Call us. We'll send you something. We'll lead you to Christ. There are many counselors right now waiting right on the other side, waiting to hear from you, waiting to call you, to pray with you, and also to counsel you. We hope to be here again next week, the same channel, the same time. Please make it a date with us. And if you are anywhere in our church branches, near our own communities, Zulere, Aja, probably Festac, and as well Abuja, worship with any of the Fota churches. God bless you. God keep you. And God will always preserve you. Thank you. Bye-bye.